Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2013 BioRand Proteon webinar series. My name is Ruben Luo, and I am the product manager of the BioRad Proteon product line. Today, we will have our third webinar in this year's series. We are honored to have Mr. Jay Duffner as our speaker. Mr. Duffner is currently a senior scientist at Momenta Pharmaceuticals, Cambridge, Massachusetts, USA. He obtained his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering at Tufts University. In 2008, he received his master's degree in biotechnology from Northeastern University. He began his work with biomolecular interaction analysis at the Broad Institute in 2004, looking at small molecule protein interactions. He joined Momenta Pharmaceuticals in 2008, working with sugar protein and protein-protein interactions in Momenta's biologics programs. Mr. Duffner has been using the surface plasma resonance, or SPR, technology for over eight years. In 2011, his lab bought a Proteon XPR36 system, which was used to investigate heparin protein interactions, developing binding assays for more than 32 heparin binding proteins. In addition, the instrument has been used to investigate the interactions of antibodies with various proteins. In today's webinar, he will share several SPR techniques that can be used to improve the quality and the chances of success in the development of assays with histact proteins. During the webinar, you can type your questions in the Q&A box and send to me. I will hold all the questions until the end and pass them to the speaker. OK, let us welcome Mr. Duffner to present. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction, Ruben, and um, I'd like to thank all the uh, attendees for listening to the live presentation, and for those who might be listening on uh, a rebroadcast, uh, thanks for uh, tuning in. So what I'd like to do is uh, share some experiences that I've had working with HIST-tagged proteins using the HTG sensor chip. Um, but before we get into those HIST-tagged proteins, I want to give a little bit of background into uh, surface plasmon resonance as a technique, and the uh, XPR36 instrument, uh, so that we all have a, a little bit of context for the um, what I'll be talking about with the HTG sensor chip. So I'll begin my presentation. So surface plasmon resonance, many know that it is a technique that's used to measure the affinity of interactions. It uh, looks at interactions in real time where you can measure on rates and off rates of interactions. Uh, one uh, element of an interacting pair is bound to the sensor surface, either covalently or it's uh, captured. And the second species is flowed over in solution and then uh, washed off, and we look at the on rate and the off rate, and from the interaction kinetics measuring Ka and Kd, we can determine what the uh, affinity of the interaction is. Um, but beyond affinity, you can use this uh, technique for many other things. You can use it for concentration analysis. You can use it to measure inhibition constants. Uh, you can look at the uh, stoichiometry of interactions. You can also look at the thermodynamics of interactions. So there's actually many different ways that you can use this biophysical technique beyond just measuring um, affinity. Um, uh, but many different types of biomolecules can be examined using this uh, technique. You can look at small molecules and proteins, nucleic acids, and uh, sugars and any of interactions among those, uh, those four different things. Um, it is often paired with other biophysical characterization techniques such as analytical ultracentrifugation, isothermal titration calorimetry, uh, fluorescence resonance energy transfer, fret, uh, the thermal shift assay, or um, the, the scintillation proximity assay, SPA, or, or even ELISAs. So 
Um, on its own, it's a very informative technique, but if you combine it with other techniques such as ITC, you can learn a lot about your, um, your interaction. The way surface plasmon resonance works is typically you have a uh, reflecting gold layer. And on one side of that gold layer, you have a flow channel where your interaction takes place. And on the other side of that gold layer, you have a prism uh, where polarized light is passed through the prism. And the reflected light is detected by a detector. Now, uh, what a plasmon is, is it's uh, energy coupled from light into the electrons of that uh, gold layer. And at a certain angle of incidence, when that light hits the uh, gold layer, the energy gets coupled to the electrons and then exits the system. And so when you look at the reflected light, you end up seeing sort of a dim spot wherever this, um, wherever this plasmon is occurring. The, um, Conditions very close to that gold layer affect uh, where this plasmon occurs and at what angle of incidence this plasmon occurs. And one of the things that affects it most dramatically is the refractive index very close to that uh, gold layer. So when you have um, an interaction taking place on that sensor surface, you have some sort of molecule displacing the water or the buffer that's very close to that sensor surface. That changes the refractive index which then gets sensed by a change in the incident angle of light at which the, pla the plasmon occurs. And this shift is the SPR dip shift as it's shown on the, um, on the slide here. This is a typical sensorgram from a um, surface plasmon resonance instrument. You have time on the x-axis and you have uh, uh, response units on the y-axis, which is a measurement of that SPR shift I was showing in the previous slide. Typically, you take a baseline where the, whatever is on your sensor surface is completely unoccupied. You then introduce your um, interacting partner in solution, and you look at the association phase. And what controls the shape of this curve is the um, the on rate and the off rate, as you have this dynamic equilibrium happening between molecules going on and off of the sensor surface. So both the on and the off rate impact the shape of this type of curve. And at some point, you may reach an equilibrium where the on rate equals the off rate. So uh, you have no more change in the um, amount of binding that you get. You then quickly switch to um, a solution phase that does not contain any of your analyte. And what you get is a pure dissociation phase where only the off rate uh, impacts the shape of that curve. You then uh, typically have a regeneration phase where you have some sort of solution, either a change in pH or a change in salt or some sort of change in condition that knocks the uh, interaction off so that you have unoccupied um, uh, ligand on the sensor surface. So now on to the BioRad Proteon XPR36 instrument. This has a flow channel system where six different things can be introduced into the uh, sensor chip at one time. The, um, the direction of the flow can be changed between vertical and horizontal. And at the cross points of these horizontal and vertical um, uh, channels, uh, this creates 36 detection spots, um, which you can immobilize or capture 36 different species. Um, in between those spots, you have uh, interspots, which you can use as a uh, blank subtraction. So really, you have um, 72 spots, um, 36 of which can be used for interaction, and 36 can be used for your, um, uh, for, for, for your blank. So here's a uh, schematic of the, the way that this works. You have your sensor chip and uh, your multi-channel module, your MCM. And in this case, we're, we have our MCM in the horizontal position. 
and you can easily switch it to the – oh, I'm sorry, we had it in the vertical position, now we're in our horizontal position, so that you can create these two different uh, flow, uh, flow systems. So let me show you an example of how we would um, uh, put together an experiment, um, one-shot kinetics as an example. So first we would activate the sensor surface. Typically you do some sort of amine coupling, although many other different types of chemistries can be used. So we activate the surface with EDC and NHS that creates activated carboxylic acid groups. We then flow over the um, species that we want to immobilize on the sensor chip or the uh, ligand and that uh, covalently binds to the sensor surface. We then deactivate the sensor surface so that uh, nothing else will covalently uh, bind to the sensor surface. We can then change the direction of the channels to horizontal. And now we can flow over our analyte, our interacting species and watch what happens to our six different mobilized um, ligands. We get some binding occurring. And then we can flow through with buffer and we can watch the uh, species dissociate from the sensor surface. And this is what a typical sensorgram looks like. And this is showing um, six different ligands and uh, six different concentrations of the, uh, the analyte. So we can very quickly measure a lot of interactions at one time. And the Proteon software can then be used to fit these curves to, to, um, to figure out what your uh, constants of interaction are. Okay, on to working with histidine DAG proteins. So, uh, histidine tag proteins are great because they are uh, ubiquitous. Um, they, you, you can find a lot of different types that are commercially available. So we can use this HTG sensor chip to, to um, capture these histidine tag proteins. So it's a TRIS NTA functionalized chip. Uh, you typically activate the surface with, uh, with soluble nickel. You flow over uh, um, and capture histidine tag proteins, 6x, 6x hist and 10x hist both work. Um, you then perform the interaction. And then you can regenerate the surface either with a very high concentration of EDTA, 300 millimolar, or you can use a low pH like pH 1.5 uh, glycine. Either one works. So as I mentioned, there's advantages to using this chip. Many, many commercially available proteins available with his tags. Very easy to regenerate, very easy to activate. You can do lots of cycles without having to do um, immobilizations time after time again. Uh, there's no need for regeneration scouting either. Um, regeneration scouting is finding conditions that break up an interaction, but that leaves proteins active. Often that's um, one of the more challenging things to do when you covalently attach your ligands to a sensor surface. The disadvantage, uh, disadvantages of this type of um, format is that tris NTA produces very strong negative charge on the sensor chip, and uh, positively charged proteins can sometimes bind non-specifically. There's a couple things you can do to, uh, to combat this. You can uh, add a surfactant to your sensor, sur to, to, sorry, to your running buffer, or you can increase the salt concentration with some magnesium chloride you know, if you have kind of a weak, nonspecific interaction happening with the negative charge, these can take care of it, but th it's not usually too successful to use this, these techniques. Uh, also, many, many proteins and other biomolecules bind specifically to, to nickel. So um, that's one of the things that we need to take care of, and I'll show you some examples of uh, how, we can actually, um, how we can actually do this. And the example I'm going to show you today is uh, working with uh, an antibody interaction with a histagged FC gamma receptor. So the ligand is the, uh, the FC gamma receptor and our analyte is the antibody at, uh, at high concentration. 
So what we want to do is measure the impact of structural modifications to antibodies on FC receptor interaction. And um, we know that amino acid and glycan modifications can affect the receptor affinity, so we're very interested in these types of interactions. We have multiple antibodies to test. We have multiple receptors to examine, so it's the perfect application for this multiplex type system um, that the Proteon XPR36 affords us. Uh, we have low affinity to high affinity interactions to examine, so it's quite a wide range of concentrations we'll need to test. So the, I'm going to set, show you experimental setup and then several experiments that we did as an iteration towards, towards developing a, a, an assay that was uh, robust and repeatable. So what we did was we picked uh, three receptors to look at, uh, receptor 1, receptor 2, and receptor 3. Um, and you can see that we measure, for receptor 1 and receptor 2, we captured high, a high level of the receptor and a low level of the receptor. And it's usually good to do this in XPR experiments because this allows us to, to make sure that our um, interactions are free from bias. If you're getting the same constants at high and low uh, ligand levels on the sensor surface, then you have much more confidence in the numbers that are coming from your, your experiment. It's really good practice to make sure that your interactions are the same at high, uh, high um, capture levels and at lower capture levels, or, or at least over a, a range. So the receptors are captured in the vertical direction, and then the solution phase protein, in this case the antibody, is flowed over in the horizontal direction. So our first experiment we tried, it was not with the HTG sensor chip, it was just a regular GLC sensor chip, so just uh, the um, uh, carboxylic acid groups, and uh, we mixed EDC and NHS to activate the surface. We flowed over the histide receptors uh, in pH 5.0 and deactivated the surface with ethanolamine. So uh, we got about 437 response units of the receptor immobilized, so that should be plenty to see a signal with, with an antibody binding. It should produce a maximum signal of 1,000 response units, which is way more than we would actually run the assay in. Uh, but what we got was nothing. Um, so EDC and NHS, uh, a mean coupling of this sensor of this uh, receptor caused loss of receptor activity, so obviously this was not going to work. So then we moved in experiment two to the HTG chip. So we have a set of graphs on the left-hand side which show receptor capture, so I'll be talking about those first. So step one, we flow 10 micromolar nickel sulfate in the vertical direction, and then we flow different uh, concentrations of the uh, same histagged receptor in the vertical direction. So this creates multiple surface densities, one for each vertical lane. And the one on the top left, that's actually uh, just buffer being flowed through, so there's, there's no protein, uh, there's no receptor there at all. And the, the one in the, um, just to the right of it has a little bit more, and then um, the one that has the most would be um, the second column down on the, the bottom. So we create this range of ligand densities to, to test this interaction. Then so look at the uh, protein binding, the six, set of six graphs there. Uh, we have a uh, dilution series of the um, antibody being flowed over, the analyte, and we can see that in all sensor channels we get some sort of binding. So um, even the sensor channel when we don't have any receptor. And so what we get is horrible, horrible nonspecific binding, something that we, we, never, we never want to see. And so we were a little bit discouraged by this, um, but we, we um, talked about it a little bit and uh, decided, okay, well, maybe there's uh, some interaction with the, the nickel on the sensor surface. Maybe we can selectively remove some of the nickel um, such that, you know, we, and, and also not disturb the ligand that's already bound. And so we were able to find some conditions that did this. So in experiment three, 
what we did was we flowed over the 10 micromolar nickel sulfate to activate the sensor surface. We then flowed over the histag receptor in the vertical direction, just like the previous experiment. And then we flowed over 100 millimolar EDTA in the horizontal direction. What this did is it removed the residual nickel without removing the uh, anti without moving the receptor, the histag receptor that was already bound to the sensor surface. And we confirmed this by looking at what happens to the sensorgram after injecting the 100 millimolar EDTA. And that's the sensorgrams that you see here. Um, you see a little baseline at first, and then you see a big spike because it's a big salt concentration with the 100 millimolar EDTA. And then you can see, if you look at the top left and then the bottom right graphs, the magnitude of decrease is the same for those two graphs. Now, the top left graph has no receptor on the sensor surface. It only has the, the nickel that's being captured. And the bottom right has about 100 response units of captured protein on it. And you can see that the decrease after adding the 100 millimolar EDTA is the same for the top left and the bottom right graphs. And this indicates to us that uh, the protein, the receptor that's mobilized on the sensor surface has been left alone. And that the only thing that's been removed is the residual uh, nickel that isn't participating in the, um, the sensor chip receptor interaction. So this is, this is actually really, really heartening. So we then took the sensor chip and we flowed over our analyte. which is our antibody. And I'm showing you uh, in this set of graphs here on the left-hand side, it's the raw data. On the right-hand side, it's the reference subtracted data. And we can see that we are getting an antibody receptor interaction and that we're getting increasing amounts of interaction um, as we have increasing amounts of ligand on the sensor surface. And so this makes a lot of sense to us. This looks really good. Uh, and if we look at our top left graph where we don't have any receptor, on the sensor surface, uh, we get no binding. So that's, um, that's, that's really good. That's what we wanted to see. So we're really excited about this. So we said, okay, great, we've got an assay. We're, we're, we're going to move forward with this. But when we uh, started doing repeats of the same injection, in 10 minutes, our nice, well-behaved interaction turned from what we have on our left-hand side here, those six graphs, into what we have on the right-hand side. Uh, our nonspecific binding is back. Uh, we were like, what is going on? Uh, so the nonspecific interaction is back. It's time dependent. And we thought, well, you know, we still have our uh, NTA on the, on the sensor surface. Uh, possibly it's picking up residual uh, divalent cations, maybe nickel, maybe cobalt, maybe something else from the, uh, from the buffer. So it's sort of uh, you know, acting like a chelator itself and then the um, antibody can bind to that, uh, that uh, divalent cation that's on the uh, sensor surface. So um, we thought, okay, we have to take care of this if we're going to have a robust assay. So what we did next was we um, added um, 100 micromolar EDTA to the running buffer. So um, this is not 100 millimolar, uh, it's 100 micromolar, so just a tiny amount of uh, EDTA to the running buffer. So we did the same steps as we did in the previous experiments. We flowed uh, 10 micromolar nickel sulfate in the vertical direction, flowed his tag receptor in PBS in the vertical direction to create the surface with multiple densities. And then we flowed over 100 millimolar EDTA in the horizontal direction to remove residual nickel. And then we switched to the horizontal direction for measurement of the uh, protein receptor interaction. Um, and that addition of the small amount of EDTA to the running buffer was enough to do it. So it uh, chelated that residual nickel and we got a viable assay. And the reason we say it's a viable assay is because the receptor, if we look at the Rmax, the binding level that we expect to our theoretical Rmax, we get about 80% activity, which is um, good enough for what we're, we're trying to do. Um, the nonspecific binding doesn't interfere. And if we do the same thing, same injections uh, over the period of uh, three hours, we see only about a 10% loss of activity. Um, that's what's shown here in equilibrium analysis, um, two identical experiments done three hours apart. We see about 10% loss of activity, which is um, you know, something we can deal with. That's, uh, 
good enough for us to have a uh, viable assay. And we think that this, these techniques here can be broadly applied to just about any um, histag protein interaction that you, um, you might want to examine. So to recap, uh, working with histidine proteins on the BioRad Proteon HTG sensor chip, uh, to prevent or to re reduce nonspecific binding, you load nickel on the surface with 10 micromolar nickel sulfate, add 100 micromolar EDTA to the running buffer to chelate trace metals, and after you do your capture of the um, ligand, you can flow over 100 millimolar EDTA, and that should leave your, pro your um, histidine tag protein interaction uh, alone so that you can go and do the interaction you really care about. So a note of caution, um, one thing we did notice is that 100 millimolar EDTA can remove the histag proteins at 37C. All these experiments were actually done at 25C. So if you're going to do that uh, higher temperature experiment, you may have to play around with that um, EDTA concentration to remove the residual uh, nickel. So that is the end of this presentation. And at this time, I, I'll take uh, any questions that any of the attendees might have. Great. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation, Jay. It's really, uh, it's really, really excellent. Uh, let us open the floor to take questions. Again, if you have questions, please type in the Q&A box, and I will pass them to the speaker. So we already have some questions came in. Uh, the first question is, could you explain a little bit about uh, using magnesium chloride, uh, no PBS, for re to reduce nonspecific binding? I think this question is related to slide number 15, right. where you were talking about the advantages and disadvantages of HDD chip. Yeah, let me move to that, to that slide. Okay, so um, one of the reasons that we um, you, you adding magnesium chloride um, that increases the ionic strength of the, um, the the running buffer, and sometimes that's just enough to prevent these uh, these charge-based interactions from occurring. Um, it's not always successful. Sometimes it's just you know reduces the magnitude a little bit. And the reason we say no PBS is that sometimes you, with magnesium and PBS you can, you can get precipitates, um, especially if it sits around for a while. So, you have to, so I would use a, either a TRIS buffer or a HEAPS buffer or, or something like that instead of a PBS if you're going to use uh, magnesium chloride. Um, what, you, what will happen is you can get clogging of some of the, the valves in your, your instrument and the uh, and, uh, yeah, the, the service people wouldn't really like that very much. <laughs> Great. Um, and second question actually is related to the overall the, 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 the great story that you told us. So you optimized the conditions of uh, using EDTA, 100 micromolar EDTA to remove the residual nickel ions while uh, adding 100 micromolar EDTA to keep the surface clean not contaminated by other metal ions. So did you, how, how long did you optimize the process, and how many different concentrations did you try? Uh, if you, we use higher or lower concentration of EDTA, what would happen? Um, I did do a several concentrations, and I'm trying to remember exactly what. So I, I believe that if, for removing the residual nickel, I think if you used 10 um, millimolar EDTA, that wasn't enough to remove the nickel from the NTA. I think you need a little higher than 10, so somewhere between 10 millimolar and 100 millimolar uh, should work. Um, in terms of adding it to the uh, running buffer, I believe that we just added 100 micromolar and saw that it worked and didn't optimize it uh, any further. And this probably is, has you know, something to do with, you know, the, the source of your um, PBS or the source of your salts, you know, how much um, metal, other, other metal contamination do you have in those types of uh, systems. Because uh, I've noticed that if, you, um, if you're trying to load the sensor surface with, uh, with nickel, um, you know, sometimes even uh, nanomolar to micromolar amounts of um, nickel, nickel sulfate 
will still load. So even you know tiny amounts of metal will still be chelated pretty efficiently by the sensor surface. I see. So part of that question also asked about uh, was this washing step still necessary when using uh, 100 micromolar EDTA in the running buffer? I think by washing step, probably it means uh, in the dissociation phase. So what do you think? Do you still have keep 100 micromolar uh, EDTA uh, during the dissociation phase? Um, well, we put the 100 micromolar EDTA in the running buffer, so it will be there during the dissociation phase. It will also be there during the um, association phase. The 100 millimolar, the reason you do that right after ligand capture is because you really need to remove that uh, nickel on the sensor surface that isn't participating in the histagged protein uh, binding. So that's, that's, the, that's the reason for that. I'm not sure if I answered that question um, exactly. Mm -hmm. I see. Yes, you did. I think uh, in the association phase, my personal uh, opinion is it's good to keep it the same as association phase. Though I don't think it matters because they're supposedly in, in the association phase, everything should be washed out from the surface. So yeah, having I mean, 100 reason, micromolar yeah, EDTA is good. The, the reason it's there it's is preventing. It's, yeah, to prevent any of the nickel um, binding as the buffer is just being flowed through. Because with the proteon system, even when you're not doing an interaction, it's still flowing some buffer through in uh, standby mode. And when it's doing that, mm -hmm. if there's any uh, divalent cations that are in there, um, it's, the sensor is going to pick it up unless it's chelated by something else. Exactly. So it's actually a, a, a method to reduce, uh, non, how to say that, rebinding effect. Correct. Kind of. Great. So our next question is, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. yeah, please, go ahead. Um, so the um, 100 micromolar EDTA in the running buffer seems to have very little effect on the amount of histag protein, say, leaching off of the sensor surface over time. Um, it, we, can, we can do one capture and use it for, uh, for three hours, and it seems uh, pretty stable. We see only 10% loss of activity, and that could be either due to leaching or it could be just due to the protein itself losing, um, losing activity. So it seems pretty stable. Yes. Great. The next question is, uh, so 100 millimolar EDTA prevents background buildup, but 300 millimolar uh, strips the, uh, the protein from the surface. So uh, you know, I think she just wants you to confirm these ratios. So I think uh, you, you probably already answered this question during the last one, you know, in our last discussion. So I think the question is to confirm that we use 300 millimolar uh, as uh, EDTA as a regeneration buffer, and we use 100 millimolar to remove the residual nickel ions. So right, and then 100 yeah, micromolar so in the running buffer. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So actually, I'm a little curious. Uh, did you try like 200 millimolar? Uh, did you see any significant leaching of the, uh, the, the the protein from the surface? Uh, you know, I did those experiments, and I don't exactly remember what happened. Because <laughs> um, at some point between 100 and 300, you're going to start getting uh, removing some of your ligand. And I don't remember exactly. what at what at what point that occurs. I, I, and I think honestly, what 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 um, may have an impact on that is um, basically the conditions of your the protein system you're working with itself, whether it's a 6s his, 6x hiss or a 10x hiss, or um, whether it's N-terminal or C-terminal, how accessible it is. So I think the local conditions are, gonna, are going to have um, more of an effect on that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So this should be a threshold. So anyway, 100 millimolar is safe. That's Good for sure. Good place to start. That's what yeah. we know. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, next question. Uh, you mentioned you use 10 micromolar nickel sulfate. Uh, are you always using this concentration, or have you tried different concentrations of nickel sulfate as activation, as the activator? Other concentrations will work. Of uh, nickel so sulfate. I, I, don't, I don't really know what the limit is. Um, uh, I, I know we've tried different concentrations, and uh, we did this optimization about uh, 
probably a year and a half ago, so I don't remember offhand. Um, but other concentrations will definitely will definitely work. Yeah, I see. Yeah, activation. I think it's uh, less sensitive. I mean, the, the the system is less sensitive to the activation step compared yeah. to the uh, yeah the, the running the, the the real the the regeneration and and the running steps. Right. With um, the with the concentration I've suggested here, you're you're getting a, a lot of nickel onto the sensor sensor surface um, more than you need. So it's probably saturated at, at that point. So if you want to, you know, maybe put a little bit less on, you can. You can definitely titrate that down a bit. I see. Great suggestion. Um, next question. Not all histac proteins bind with the same affinity to nickel. Can this affect the to the effect of 100 millimolar EDTA to reduce non-specific binding? I I think the question is my understanding is, do you need to change the 100 millimolar EDTA? According to the properties of different proteins, and I and I would expect the answer to that would be yes. Um, in terms of accessibility of those his tags, um, you know, whatever the microenvironment is around them, it's going to be different from protein to protein. So uh, it's definitely something you'll have to investigate when first looking at a protein uh, interaction. I see. Great. So, um, so far we don't have any more questions coming in. Okay. So let me let's just wait a, a yeah a couple seconds. If there are no more questions, we can end today's webinar. Sure. Okay. Since there are no more questions. We will end today's webinar now. I would like to thank you all for attending the presentation and participating in the discussion, especially to Jay. Thank you again for the great presentation. It's very yeah, you're welcome. And I think my, uh, my pleasure. Yeah, everyone learned something. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you are interested in knowing more about this application, please feel free to contact me directly. My email address is posted in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, we will also send out a follow-up email in which you will find the recording download link. Okay, uh, thank you again for joining us. Depending on where you are, I hope you have a great day or a good night. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>